Jeff. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Andrea Sirtash, and I'm going to be relieving Jeff for a while. He actually told me, just be like me up here, which is, which is hard. Um, he's doing a great job. So I'm really, really excited to introduce the next speaker. Her talk is entitled, Twitter, a Love Story. I personally almost broke up with Twitter a number of times. Um, so that's awesome. Her name is Laura Fitton. She is the founder of 140.inc. And she's the co-author of Twitter for Dummies. Yeah. All right, so I do a lot of consulting and talking and writing and stuff about Twitter for Business, and I'm not going to today. It's actually fairly personal. Uh, my name's Laura. You can call me Pistachio. Probably you already do. Um, I am indeed, as accused, uh, the ringleader of the Twitter for Dummies crew. Comes out July 6th. Sorry, not pitching. Um, and I do have a startup I just closed Angel Round on that's hopefully going to help make more sense of the Twitter ecosystem. But I'm also the girl who fell in love with Twitter. And I really did. That's, that's embarrassing to stand on stage and say, I'm in love with Twitter. Uh, but I am. And if you followed me, you know that. No surprise. Um, later I'm going to get around to telling you why. Let me start with a totally unrelated story of a security guard at Children's Hospital. Has been called into a cycle of security guards watching a mom and a nine-month-old nine baby. The baby has a broken arm. The hospital's trying to figure out why this nine-month-old baby has a broken arm. The mom's trying to figure out why this baby has a nine-month uh, broken arm. And the requirement is the door must stay open, the curtain around the bed cannot be pulled, the mom cannot take the baby into the bathroom, the mom cannot leave the room with the baby, and the security guard is sitting there staring point blank at them the whole time. And one security guard comes on his shift, and instead of staring and playing this weird, I have a taser and a uniform and you're in a hospital feeling very uncomfortable game, he reaches out his hand and he says his name and he says, I want to be known to you. And the next six hours is a lot different than any other six-hour block in that hospital because of that little tiny trivial interaction, because of that overcoming of the other. I mean, what a, what a situation fraught for suspicion and distrust and discomfort, right? So what Megan said earlier today about right-wing, left-wing, overcoming the other and finding what we have in common, what Ann Curry said so poignantly about the sensitivity with which you must address the subject of your news coverage, to not have that implicit hostility, right? So I think this is a huge portion of why Twitter is so powerful. That little trivial interactions, just that simple statement, I want to be known to you. I don't want to be the stranger. I don't want to be this strange other, right? That overcoming of the other leads to what we're feeling on Twitter. What, what, you know, forget what are you doing. I think your Twitter answers are both asking and answering, what do we have in common? And I think that's when it gets really powerful, and I get a little woo-woo on this and say, look, Twitter runs on love. So I'm here to tell Twitter a love story and make the case that Twitter is powered by love. So if Twitter is what do we have in common and what do we share, and everybody's trying to find their different ways. Yeah, you all have heard the thing about six people with a blindfold describing an elephant. Is that Twitter or what, right? You ask any six people what is Twitter, you're gonna get 36 answers at least. It's so many things to so many different people. One metaphor I put out there is that Twitter's like a village. And that Twitter is a space in which we're having, again, these random, really trivial interactions. People like to pee on Twitter and go like, ah, it's about what I, you know, did I have a sandwich, right? And yet, I saw a tweet this morning, uh, I think it was Ted Chris, the guy who, Chris Anderson from the TED conference, so relieved to just see any tweet at all out of one of the Iranian protesters who hadn't tweeted in 24 hours. And that was scary and upsetting. I have someone in my stream who I follow who's fighting pancreatic cancer. God damn it, when she tweets she's having a sandwich, I'm pretty happy. So sometimes those trivial interactions are what weave the fabric of what brings us together. And that's what I try and get across when I talk about this kind of crazy Twitter is my village concept. Because see, we think we're getting into new things and brave new radical sharing, but this is old things. This is accountability. This is responsibility to one another. This is connectedness. This is the kind of trust that builds up gradually and only through trivial interactions. Any fans of The Little Prince here? Yeah? Do you remember the chapter with the fox? 
Right? So the little prince is this little boy, and he's trucking around, and he meets a fox, and he's like, oh, hey, let's play. I want to pet you. I want to play with you. And the fox says, no, no, you can't do that. You need to tame me first. And taming is kind of a ritualized presence, just coming a little bit every day for a short period of time and getting to know each other. So that's kind of what happens on Twitter. And I know for me, 9-11, probably in 2007, was one of the first times I really picked up on this perceptible campfire feeling as we all came together and shared our stories on Twitter. Very emotional. I know everybody here has an equivalent story, has seen something like that that really brought people together. Incidentally, I threw a survey out there on Pistachio Consulting saying, look, what technology is Twitter disrupting? Is it email? Is it Facebook? I threw in the word isolation because my own personal story, I literally, I loved the mom panel. I was a mom of two kids under two and totally homebound like two years ago. Nobody had heard of me and, and here I am writing books and whatever. It's been a crazy journey, right? So I threw out there in this survey, Facebook, I am, email, what technology does Twitter disrupt? And I also threw in the word isolation. And guess what won? Like it came in number two behind Facebook. Isolation leaves people not only alone, but unaware of their power. It can be pernicious. It can really hold people back. So what happens, like we're seeing in Iran, what happens when people's isolation is broken down, when they're not alone? Harvard Business School professor Andrew McAfee made a wonderful comment that I saw it summed up a lot. He said, with Kindle, I'm never without my books. With Twitter, I'm never without my people. It's mobile, it's coming with us. We're not alone, again. Have you ever stood on a subway platform, or I'm from Boston, Red Sox, uh, so on the T platform, and you see people and you can kind of see the cares, the ordinary everyday stresses they're carrying with them, right? And they're all carrying cell phones too. And I look at them and I think, God, you know, they have loved ones, they have cell phones, and they have worries. Wouldn't it rock if someday Twitter was so mainstream that they were all connecting each other in the moments that they needed it, in the times that they needed it? Because when you're not alone, right? Ali Sheedy, my generation loved The Breakfast Club. I don't want to be alone anymore. You don't have to be, right? So that's, that's what I'm seeing happen on Twitter. And when you're not alone, when, when James Carl Buck was not alone because of Twitter, he tweeted the word arrested and got out of jail in Egypt. It was a pretty freaking big deal. When Giannis Crumbs was not alone on the Hudson with his twit pic, we all found out about the Hudson River crash and got an incredibly poignant picture, and he was an internationally published photojournalist before he stepped off the fa ferry. When Amanda Rose was not alone in her wish to gather people together at Tweet Ups Worldwide, she raised a quarter of a million dollars to build wells in the third world in like, what, three weeks? Where's Amanda? Amanda, are you here? She's my yeah, freaking hero. So when you are not alone, incredible things become, power, be, become possible. And in fact, today's mission, right, of, of not being alone, you know that scene in Spartacus where everybody stands up and says, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. Someone threw this out here this morning, and I don't know if it's true, but it was really beautiful. Change your location on Twitter to Tehran. Change your time period to plus 3.30, uh, 3.30 GMT, and it's going to make it harder, and I don't know if this is true technologically, but the thought is this would make it harder for the true dissidents to be tracked down by the government. The standing up and saying, you are not alone, we stand together here. So some incredibly powerful things happen and become possible on Twitter. And one metaphor or one thing that really resonated, have any of you seen Clay Shirky's relatively famous internet video where he's speaking about Pearl as a Shinto shrine? And he talks about how this open source community Pearl has sustained itself over the years because people wake up every morning loving Pearl and loving one another in the context of Pearl. And as soon as I thought, I was like, damn, that's Twitter. And this was like two years ago, right? So this was kind of out there. Every morning, people wake up loving Twitter and on some level loving, trusting, being more connected to one another in the context of Twitter. And that is why it's so powerful and so self-sustaining and going on and on and on. So yeah, I am the girl who fell in love with Twitter. And the reason why is because I was that mom in the hospital dealing with the allegations of child abuse. And three of the darkest weeks of my life, I could barely tweet. I'd really just gotten into Twitter, um, 
because anything I said was going to look bad and look wrong, and I knew I hadn't do it, done it, and I just had to wait until time passed. And the people who reached out to me then, Chris Brogan came and saw me in the hospital. Friends I'd only met at Tweet Ups. I was very isolated in Boston. I didn't know a lot of people. Came and took me out for a drink, gave me a break at the hospital, stood by my side. I was isolated. And my story is this. Someone who was isolated became stronger, happier, braver, and more capable because of the connections that I found on Twitter, because of the love that I found on Twitter. Twitter fundamentally lives on, thrives on, runs on love. Thank you.